the, the book that you mentioned, The Question That Never Goes Away, that year, it was 2012, I spoke a lot of times on the question of where is God when it hurts. Three really stood out. One was, was the tsunami in Japan. It was the anniversary of the tsunami, and I heard story after story. We saw the devastation. One was the, the siege city of Sarajevo, where 10,000 people died. And then the last one was the smallest in scale, but the most difficult emotionally, that was Newtown, Connecticut, which happened to be during the Christmas season. It was just uh, a few days after Christmas when we went out there and met some of the parents and the first responders and people like that. And as I looked back, I thought, that was quite a year. <laughs> Here we had this natural disaster, then we had this war disaster, and then we've got this uh, small but wrenching, poignant scene of these little children who are killed just sitting in their classroom. And there's the question that never goes away. Hi, my name is Colleen Spindall Thompson. I am a director at Insight for Living. And one of the delights of the job that I have is to interview people who offer words of hope and help to those who are longing for a word or a phrase or something to hang on to in their day. Today I am delighted to introduce to you Philip Yancey who's going to be joining us. Philip, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Colleen. Philip, you've been a part of the Swindoll family household for many years and a lot of other households along the way. You have over 24 books in print, 13 gold medallion award books, congratulations. Thank you. 15 million in print in 35 languages, which is incredible. Um, you're married to Janet, who has been a social worker, but now gets the honor of traveling with you. And I'm sure you make a wonderful team. Um, Philip, you've written on the question why quite often. In fact, it seems to be a core theme of many of your works. Where is God when it hurts? The gift of pain, prayer, does it really matter? Disappointment with God. All of these center around why. In fact, the opening of your book begins with, my father contracted polio just before my first birthday. Paralyzed from the neck down, he lay immobile in a noisy iron lung machine. My mother would bring my three-year-old brother and me to the hospital hmm. and hold us up to the window hmm. so that by looking in the mirror, her husband could gl catch a glimpse of the sons he would never hold. Preparing to go to Africa as a missionary, thousands of people in a prayer chain were involved. They could not believe that God would take someone so young, so vibrant, with such a wonderful ministry ahead. The closest to him became convinced that he would be healed. So they took the leap of faith and removed him from the iron lung. And within two weeks, my father died. I grew up fatherless under that cloud of unanswered prayer. Philip, I'm wondering if you have found an answer to the prayers that you have offered to the Lord. Briefly, no, I have not. Colleen, the very first book I wrote was a book called Where Is God When It Hurts? That was back in 1977, probably before a lot of your listeners were even alive. And it came out <laughs> of exactly what you described. It came out of that question that hung over my childhood about my father. These people prayed, they loved him. It seemed to be a totally virtuous prayer that this young man who wanted to be a missionary could be healed. But what I learned is that there are some things that are really not in our orbit. That's kind of the message of the book of Job. Job wanted to know why too. God showed up. God had an opportunity to tell Job why, and he didn't. What he said was, Job, you couldn't possibly understand. And it's important when we're suffering to be aware of what we can get from the Bible and what we can't get from the Bible. I cannot get a, an answer to the question of why. Why did the tornado hit this town, not that town? Why did this little three-year-old girl get leukemia, not the girl in the house next to her? I can't answer that. And when Jesus had that question posed to him by the disciples who would see a person who was blind or someone who had been killed by a falling tower, he also turned their attention from the why, which is kind of backwards looking. Why did that happen? And turned it forward. Okay, bad things happen. Now that they've happened, how will you respond? That's really the test that we're 
asked to respond to. Do we, do we respond with trust in a loving God? I, there are some things I do know the answer to. I know the answer to how God feels about those who are going through suffering and hard times. And the way I know that answer is just by following Jesus around. Because when Jesus meets a widow who just lost her only son, or even a Roman soldier, the enemy, whose servant fell ill, Jesus always responds with comfort and healing. He never makes him feel worse. He always makes him feel better. So I, I don't talk about God's will so much. I talk about God's desire. God's desire is for us to be whole, to be healed. Yet we live on a, on a planet full of evil, full of a lot of bad things happening, full of things like the polio virus, and Christians don't have an immunity to that. So no, I've never found an answer to the why question. I found answers to other questions that I wasn't even looking for. Um, Philip, I have a hundred different things went through my mind as you answered that question, and um, probably a hundred more questions, but one of them that I remember reading in the middle of the night in the hospital was how you introduced 47 different yes. occurrences in the New Testament of the Lord calling us to reevaluate or reassess. Those aren't the words used, but the meaning is that we that we look inside of ourselves so that we can, the Lord can reveal to us himself or who he is. Do you find that people today are asking or beginning to ask more reflective questions as they go through the process of grief and suffering? I would like to say yes, but the, <laughs> the people I talk to even today will tell me almost every time there were people in my church who came oh, and said to me, oh, you must have done something terrible. God is punishing you for some sin. And I just hate to hear that because I've been preaching against it for 40 years or so. But I, I hear that again and again from people who are going through suffering. It's like we, we kind of want to put things in a neat little box. And, and this issue of suffering, you can't put those questions in a neat little box. We, we should focus, as you say, on the things that we are told. When Jesus talked with his disciples about bad things that happened, say, to the blind person, he didn't say why this person was born blind, but he did promise that somehow the works of God would be manifest in his life. Now, sometimes those works of God are manifest in remarkable healings, as happened with the man born blind. Sometimes they're not. I know your family knows uh, Johnny Erickson Tata very well, and uh, I've known her. Oh, she was one of the first articles I ever wrote as a young journalist. And yes, she was. She was uh, still recovering, really, from the, from the accident. And as I look at her, she never got the healing that she prayed for and a lot of impressive people prayed for on her behalf. But were the works of God manifest in her? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In fact, I... Colleen, as I uh, look at Johnny, I think pain that is redeemed, not taken away, but redeemed is more impressive to me than even pain that's removed. It's one thing to look back and say, well, I used to be hurting and now I'm okay. It's another thing like Johnny to live with it day after day, month after month, year after year, and yet become stronger in her faith, not weaker. Well, Philip, you bring up someone that I love dearly, and that is Johnny. Erickson Tata and how the Lord has worked through her ministry is amazing. And yet her pain has not been relieved. It's actually gotten more intensified over the years. And I want to say to the Lord, will you, could you just been a little bit nicer to my friend Johnny because her suffering was so awful. <laughs> and how many times is, does that happen where he allows us to continue, continue suffering and we continue to pray for relief when what he's longing for us to see or to be revealed is that our will is surrendered to him, whether we face relief or not. Yeah. Yeah, what's the phrase from the movie Frozen, the song? Let it go, let it go, right? <laughs> and, and there's something very Christian about that. Um, actually, that is God's message to Job. You know, Job, uh, you're not responsible for running the universe, so let it go. I am, and I'm quite comfortable with that, actually. <laughs> Um, Philip, you mentioned Let It Go, which was one of our favorite movies this last year in our home. And since I can't keep most of the fish in my fish tank alive, I think the Lord can handle the oceans. Why don't we just go ahead and let it go? That's right. That's... 
But uh, um, another person that you write of and quote is Gerald May, whose works I've also enjoyed, The Dark Night of the Soul. And you say, yes. you must be willing to endure dark periods of feeling that God isn't here, that nothing is happening, that God has given up on you. Gerald makes it very clear that if God wants to work in you, God has to do it secretly and in darkness. God can't let you know what's going on because you're likely to get in the way. I've done that a time or two. It's only the wise, broken ones who allow mm. themselves to undergo mm -hmm. God and to trustingly let go and let God. That is some of the hardest work to do. And you talk, you, you quote Habakkuk mm. and James, Lamentations, some of these incredible prophets and New and Old Testament alike, or the disciples, about how we have to let it go. What, what have been some of your darkest seasons in your own life where you've had to let go, let God have it, and endure darkness. Hmm. I spoke on this topic of pain and suffering at my church one night, and I went in my storage area, which is in the basement, that's where my office is, and I took out all of the letters that I've gotten from the books, Where Is God When It Hurts, and Disappointment with God. There are about a thousand of them. And every one of those in a sense, is a letter of unanswered prayer. Because I, I don't write for people who've had the miracles. I write for people generally who haven't had the miracles. Hence those titles, Where Is God When It Hurts and Disappointment with God. I, when I published that book, the publisher said, I don't know about that title. You know, you go into Christian bookstores, <laughs> they've got books like The Christian Secret to a Happy Life. What about How I Overcame Disappointment with God? And I said, I don't want to reach those people. They got plenty of books. You know, I want to go to people who are in the middle of it. Yeah. And when I, I sat that, I set down that uh, pile of 1,000 letters on a stool and uh, talked about prayer. And uh, just recently, I saw a trailer for a movie that's coming out soon on, on Mother Teresa. And hmm. you probably know that uh, even after she died, they discovered some journals where she went through that period of, of darkness and wondering, is God there? How, why I'm not feeling that intimacy, that, you know, that strong feeling of faith. And, and yet she, she is a saint because she said, whether I feel it or not, I believe it and I will act as if it is true. And there have been times in my life, certainly, when I just am not sure. I, I have these questions, but I act as if it is true. And there will, later the emotions do catch up. And I'm in a pretty good place right now. If you had talked to me, I don't know, last year, I would probably would have said, now is the time, <laughs> you know, when I'm in the middle of that. And for me, so much of it comes from what I absorb from the people I hear from. The, the book that you mentioned, The Question That Never Goes Away, that year, it was 2012, I spoke a lot of times on the question of where is God when it hurts. Three really stood out. One was, was the tsunami in Japan. It was the anniversary of the tsunami mm -hmm. and I heard story after story. We saw the devastation. One was the, the siege city of Sarajevo where 10,000 people died. And then the last one was the smallest in scale but the most difficult emotionally. That was Newtown, Connecticut, which happened to be during the Christmas season. It was just, uh, a few days after Christmas when we went out there and met some of the parents and the first responders and people like that. And as I looked back, I thought, that was quite a year. <laughs> Here we had this natural disaster, then we had this war disaster, and then we've got this uh, small but wrenching, poignant scene of these little children who are killed just sitting in their classroom. And there's the question that never goes away. And so I, I, once again, picked up a topic that I hadn't written on for several years. Philip, the, the Sandy Hook experience and the tsunami and the earthquakes and the things that you have um, been with people through bring me to two thoughts. One is the question that we ask of why we're asking the wrong question. The, the other point, and you draw this out, is from someone who went through some suffering. And she says, in many ways, the loss that she experienced was a gift 
to be broken open at such a young age because it gave me the rest of my life to benefit from what I had learned. In so many ways, because you were raised in a very, um, you can put words to the church that you were raised in, and you had a, um, J.B. Phillips probably identifies the kind of God picture you had as a younger person. Um, but you had to be broken open in many ways through grief and not knowing. How did you go through that experience as you were trying to work out your faith and accept the grief that you had to now be where you are? It had a huge purpose. Yes, boy, a lot of thoughts occurred to me as you're saying that. First, um, I would have to, to say about the woman whose response you read, about 80% of people who are surveyed say that their time of greatest spiritual growth was a time of hardship and suffering. I have to totally agree. That yes. is when we grow. Yes. On the other hand, I would have to say that that is not really my story. My story is, I, you, you said I could fill in the words for the church, and the, church, yeah. the word I use is toxic. <laughs> and, um, I've heard that word before yeah. a few times. <laughs> and you mentioned J.B. Phillips, who wrote, Your God is Too Small. Yes. Um, in, in my upbringing, it was, Your God is Too Mean. <laughs> yes, my, yes. My vision of God was, was this policeman up in the sky, trying to hurt us, trying to keep us from having a good time. And if you ever rebelled, he's just going to smash you. And I was told that again and again. And actually, for me, Colleen, it was getting to know the real God, who is not a policeman, who's not a smasher. He's a lover. And what brought me back to faith was not that broken period. I'd certainly been through that and have since as well. But what brought me back to faith was seeing that God is a God of goodness. It was the beauties of nature and mu music and romantic love, those things. And I realized that God had been misrepresented to me by that church. God was not this bully up there. God loved me. God wanted the very best for me. And when I got to know that God, I wanted to know that God. I had been yeah. fleeing. But what I had been fleeing from was the false image of God that the church had communicated to me. It's interesting. Um, this last year, both of my children moved, uh, moved away. My daughter got married. My son went to um, a school out of state. And both at separate times, unbeknownst to each other, said, Mom, when did you become a Christian? Hmm. And I said, well, I knew about Jesus and asked him in my heart in the little script way right. when I was little. But it wasn't until my 30s that I think I really came to know God mm -hmm. and became a Christ lover. Mm -hmm. And it was because of him loving me. Mm -hmm. Right. And, we, and you quote Psalm 23, how great he is. He's our shepherd and, and, and the wonderful feast that he lays before us and allows us to rest. But as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there are moments where we are so very terrified. Hmm. That's all a part of his love, too. Well, it strikes me, Psalm 23 directly follows Psalm 22. My God, my yeah. God, why have you forsaken me? Yes. And we certainly do have Psalm 23 moments, but we also have Psalm 22 moments. And I, I think God wisely <laughs> made sure that those two were back to back. So that if you're in a Psalm 23 moment, you don't look on these Psalm 22 people and say, oh, well, they just need to grow more spiritually. No, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus prayed Psalm 22 from the cross. And if you're going through the Psalm 22, at the same time, don't look on someone who's going through a more peaceful Psalm 23 time and say, well, you just don't, you're immature. You don't know what it's like. You know, we, we all have both of those moments. And I'm so... I, I love the Psalms because it covers the whole spread. Yes. Eugene, Eugene Peterson, who translated yes. them in the message, says that actually about two thirds of the Psalms are Psalms of lament or yes. Psalms of complaint. And when you look at them, they're very much like Job <laughs> saying, yes. you know, God, you're not doing a very good job running this world. <laughs> that's, that, <laughs> that's what a Psalm of lament is all about. And I've said that <laughs> myself a few times. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I've come to uh, respect 
a God mm. who not only allows us to voice those complaints, but gives us yes. the words to use in the Bible itself. So, you know, it's okay if you get angry. If it's, okay, it's okay if you want to lash out, if you feel silent and silence on the other end, because the psalmist have a lot of that expressed as well. So speak to the person who has been holding in that anger and wants to let that out. Because I think Thomas, um, who most called Doubting Thomas, I think he was one of the most authentic disciples. Because he really said, I, I got to see this to believe this. Speak to that person who's saying, you know what? I don't. I'm not sure that he's really going to be following through on things. Hmm. Well, sometimes I'm called to speak at universities or colleges. And if you've ever done that, you know, it's pretty, it's a tough crowd. They're out <laughs> yep. there. Uh, make me stay awake. You know, <laughs> they've been yeah. listening to professors all day long. And the last thing they want to do is hear a lecture from someone who writes Christian books. Right. But I will say something like this. I challenge you to find a single argument against God in the great atheists, people like Voltaire, David Hume, yes. uh, Bertrand Russell, or the new guys, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens. I challenge you to find a single argument, complaint against God in their writings that is not already included in the Bible. Psalms, Job, Habakkuk, Lamentations. And I say, you've got the freedom to reject God, but I, for sure. one, respect a God who gives us a word to use <laughs> if we want to reject him. So for your person going through the doubting thing, I would say, God understands you're in very good company. Mm -hmm. And my, my challenge to the church, you mentioned Thomas, my challenge to the church, Colleen, is that we would be a place, a safe place for those who need more light. Oh. What, what I love about that story of Thomas is that when Jesus was resurrected, he only appeared to small groups of people who already believed in him. He wasn't yes. trying to convert people. He was affirming those who already believed in him. Yes. And as you know, you know, 10 of the disciples were together. They saw Jesus. And then Thomas comes along and he, he reacts exactly like I would, you would, anyone yeah. would. Yeah. You know, I, look, I saw the guy die. People don't just come back. Come on. I, I saw the blood drain out of him. There's no way Jesus, I, I promise we saw him. No way, no yeah. way. And yet, I, I love the tender way that Jesus treated him. So Thomas, what uh. kind of proof do you need? Do you need to touch my wounds? You want me to eat something for you? But beyond that, Thomas was allowed in that room with the locked door. Here he, he doubted the most important fact of theology, the resurrection of Jesus. He, reject, he was a heretic by anybody's standards. And yet, the group of disciples found a place for Thomas. And that's why the church, I want it to be a safe place, because if you have those feelings, if you have those, even that anger, the only way to deal with it is to get it out among trusted people, trusting people who don't reject you, who don't react, oh, no, I can't believe you said that. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of it in the Bible. So yeah. we need to be a community that finds a place for those who are going through that dark, dark time. And um, it's interesting that you say that because my son, Jonathan, who has so many challenges and, and concepts, um, especially spiritual concepts are incredibly difficult to grasp. And so he asks probably four or five times minimum every day. So Jesus wins, right, mom? <laughs> Jesus is coming back, right, mom? Jesus will take care of us. And I, I so love that authenticity. I would never think of saying, why are you asking me that again? <laughs> right, right. He, he can't remember. And suffering brings us to the place of not remembering the good things for a while because we're mm. so deeply grieved. And so the church has got to become a place where we embrace the Jonathans of the world who say, Jesus is going to take care of me, right? Mm, right. You know, Colleen, as you were telling that story, it reminded me of a phrase that I heard long ago from a Christian author named Joe Bailey. I don't know if you know that Oh, name. yes, I love yeah, him. Yeah. And one of his phrases was, don't forget in the darkness what you learned in the light. Yes. But as you're talking, I, I think you, you could also say, don't forget in the light what you learned in the darkness. 
you know, yes. don't forget that there are some people who, who haven't found the light yet. And the reason we have a church is so that we don't have to go through these things alone. We, sh we shouldn't. You know, I, th I think actually becoming a Christian should, should come with a warning label on the front that says, do not practice this alone. <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> You, well, it's interesting because you do cite a research study on cancer survivors. I talked to this, I talked with my mom about this because uh, you talk about community. Yes. And you said those who have community have, um, on average, lived two years or longer right. than those who recover without community. That's For, profound. And I'll tell you how that works because I've talked to Dr. Koenig about it. He says, you see these studies about people who get prayed for and people who don't get prayed for, and some of them show one thing, some of them show another. But every study demonstrates exactly what I just said, that if you're plugged into a church, you'll heal faster and better. Mm -hmm. The reason is what keeps you from healing are things like stress, uh, fear, anxiety. And if you're sitting there worrying Who's going to take care of my dog? Who's going to take care of my children? Who's going to fix my meals? Uh, who's going to take me to the doctor? Your body isn't able to focus all of those beautiful built-in healing properties that God designed on getting well. But if you're plugged into a body, a community who says, we'll take care of that. Don't worry. We got a freezer full of food for you. We'll take care. We'll take your dog away for a couple of weeks. Don't worry about that. We'll look after your kids. Then you can give all of your energy to getting back to healing. You're hitting on one of the closest um, griefs that I have experienced. And I shared this this last summer for the first time on the Alaskan cruise by permission of my children. Hmm. But um, years ago, I went through a divorce and my daughter was suicidal actually, hmm. and she was self-harming. And hmm. we learned that the most judgmental place was the church. And so we yeah. kind of huddled in and went through recovery um, with some help of some, a few friends that I knew who were um, helping us recover. Some, some were doctors and helping her recover from depression and anxiety and panic attacks. Um, but it was a very, very dark time because we didn't have that kind of community. Mm. You wrote, in fact, you said, I have learned more about grace, forgiveness, diversity, and yes, social deviance from my own family than from all the theology books I have read. And you've <laughs> read a lot of them. <laughs> yes, right, right. You say Chesterton's point is, Exactly. Troublesome issues like divorce, homosexuality, take on a different cast when you confront them, not in a state legislature, but at the family reunion. Hmm. Those Christians who trumpet family values need to make clear that we are not proposing a lobotomized society of Stepford wives and their offspring. That is such a fabulous statement. <laughs> we recognize the families consist of imperfect beings. We simply contend that the family, the smallest unit, represent a good place. And what we learned, what I learned is I needed to have a lot of I needed to ask for a lot of forgiveness for mistakes I had made. Hmm. And then the children needed to know that they were safe mm -hmm. with someone who would listen and care for them. What have you found? How do you counsel families? Because that is our first community where we learn. You learn that God was a really, he was mean and a policeman in that <laughs> first community and had to come out of that. Um, how, what do you say to families creating that for their children? Hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your story, but believe me, it's not the first time I've heard that, Colleen. Hmm. Um, I keep harping on this point because there are so many stories like yours, especially on divorce. I say especially on divorce, the homosexual gay people would say, yeah, but what about us? You know, th let me tell you sure. our church stories. And yeah. All we can do is, is keep preaching it, keep preaching it. I have friends who say, I've had to actually pull away from the church for a time, but I found that supportive community, in their case, through 12-step groups, 
like AA, yes. Alcoholics Anonymous. They're and, fabulous. And I, yeah, I, and I asked them, okay, what did they do that the church didn't do? And they say, well, first they're honest. You go to church yeah. and people will put on a good face. They all want to look like things are okay, you know? How are you? Oh, I'm just fine. How are you? You don't say that at AA. How are you? Well, I had the worst week of my life. Okay, brother, you know, <laughs> radical right. honesty and then radical acceptance. You don't get kicked out because you mess up. In right. fact, when, you, when you're honest about messing up, they know that's when you're, you're getting to the place where the higher power, where God can work with you. Yes. That's the first step. If you don't get past that first step, you'll never find healing. And yeah. that's what the church needs to be. Instead, there's almost this built-in tendency to become like the Pharisees. You know, well, okay, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than those people. Oh you know, my I'm, gosh, that's a huge tendency. <laughs> yeah, I'm holier than thou. No, <laughs> are you less holy than thou? <laughs> you know, that's our right. standard here. And we're all, we're all just stumbling along, but we're stumbling along with arms linked. And if you do that, you don't always fall down. <laughs> if you're stumbling all alone, then you will fall down. And I, I, you preach it, I preach it. Uh, let's just keep saying it. And it's easy to get down on the church. Frankly, the church is composed of people just like us. And we, we don't always get it right. And it's, it's stories like yours, Colleen, that can be a prophetic word to the church. And that's why we need to keep, you know, don't give up on it. It is the bride of Christ. It's, it's God's plan so that we There's, aren't all alone here. Um, my son finally said, Mom, can you stop saying you're sorry? <laughs> <laughs> because, because I'm thinking it's so much more work to pretend to be someone you're not. Yeah, right. right. Than it is to just be who you are. Yeah. And so um, one of the greatest things about my son's many disabilities is he is who he is. He cannot pretend to be anything but himself. Mm -hmm. And while it is a very daily demanding, um, grieving um, time often, because I see the ugly part of humanity that wants to bully him and does, and right. wants to reject him and does, I see a child who, or a young man now, who keeps enduring and keeps pressing on and is a hero to me mm -hmm. because he's not fake. Yeah. And it just, it, I think um, Richard Rohr and his book on the 12 steps is absolutely fantastic. In fact, one of the things you also put in your book is that um, I think following one of the many disasters that you had visited, there was a church that put together the seven acts of mercy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love this list. <laughs> Feed the hungry, give drink to the poor, clothe the naked, house the homeless, visit the sick, ransom the capti captive, bury the dead. Yes, they were, they were given the flip side of the seven deadly sins. You know, these are the seven acts of mercy. And they're things that all of us can do. And if, if we spent our time doing those things, yeah, if we, if we spend our time doing those things, that's how God works in us. And I think that that is God's plan for the world. Yes. In fact, another church came up with a few of their ideas. Instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful, admonish the sinner. Well, I'd like to say that never won a lot of hearts. <laughs> Back to the Lord. Um, exactly. And as my mom has gone through this fusion surgery recently, my dad said, you know, I, I want to help and I want to make it better. And I said, Dad, you just need to sit by her and tell her how much you love her. Yeah. I've doing yeah, that. Yeah. I've asked so many people over the years, who helped you most? And I've never heard a single person say, oh, it was a PhD in theology from Yale Divinity School. You know, they never say that. Right. They often, they usually don't even say my pastor. Pastors right. are busy people. You, you don't get that much of their time usually. It, it's often somebody like a grandmother who's got time, who will sit there knitting until they have a need, whether it's calling the nurse or a cup of orange juice or whatever. And I think your, your dad is learning what somebody going through a hard time like that needs is just love, time, acceptance, availability.
I'm so proud of him. He's learning how to rub her feet, and it's just so great. I'm like, Dad, you're doing great with that. And he's so full of grace, but he's so full of wanting her not to hurt as well. And we often run to trying to fix it when in actuality what we need to do is to sit with a person in quietness and just be present. Isn't that what God is with us? Yeah, it is. And and your dad didn't learn that in the Marine Corps, did he? <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> um, a couple other things, and I know that our time is cutting short, Philip, but um, you wrote in Disappointment with God, you asked these three questions. Is God unfair? Is he silent? Is he hidden? And my question for you would be, which one of those three were the hardest or are the hardest for you? <laughs> <laughs> you asked if I had a few softballs to throw at you. I said, <sighs> yep, I do. <laughs> yes. Probably is God unfair is the hardest for me because I, I do get to travel around the world. And uh, just this year, we, we went to a difficult part of the world, Malaysia and Indonesia, very crowded. We were in Jakarta, Indonesia. All you see is concrete and gray sky. The pollution is so bad. It is so crowded. You never see the sun. They had these fires burning. You could hardly go outside without coughing. And I live in this beautiful place, Evergreen, Colorado, <laughs> with, yeah. you know, it's evergreen except in the winter and then it's ever white, but it's always beautiful here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, those poor people in Jakarta, they think this is what the world is like. And it's not that way. This is what humans have done to make the world ugly. And if, if I was born in Jakarta, my life would be so different than being born here in the United States. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty basic thing. But, but also, think of the conflict going on between Muslims and Christians right now. If I was born in Saudi Arabia, my life would be so different than it was being born in the Bible Belt in the United States. And then you get into the whole problem of suffering. These tsunamis that will wipe out 200,000 people. And we know what it's like when a tornado hits a town and kills maybe 12 people. This is like big news that we focus on for weeks, and we should. Right. But what would it be if it was 200,000 in the United States who died? Right. So that unfairness issue, to me, that is the biggest reason to believe in an afterlife, to believe in ultimate justice. Yeah. Because God, I hate to say this, but God owes it to us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or a few others. <laughs> if God is just and fair, he's got some work to do that is not going to be accomplished in this, in this world right now. Like yeah. the parents who lost their children, six years old, seven years old, in Sandy Hook Elementary School, there is no way you can fix that. There's no way you can wipe that off apart from a, a redo, a reset, where God says, give me time. I am going to restore this earth to the way it was intended. God is as upset over the situation going on in this world as we are. And that's one thing. I agree thing. with that. Yeah, I that's, think he is. I agree. That's one thing I've learned. I, and I can say to these people, if you grieve, trust me, God grieves more. Yeah. We know that because we, God gave us a face, the face of Jesus. And when he saw suffering, when he saw, he cried three times, you know, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen, and he burst out into tears. At least three times we know that he cried. And so Jesus was deeply grieved by some of the things happening on this planet. And it's important to know that God is on our side. He feels about the bad things just like we do. He doesn't want them and more. God has promised to take them away. There will be a time when there are no more tears, no more death. Mm. And we just have to trust him on that. Yes, we do. I was speaking with a gal who had been raped. Mm. And she said, where was God? You know, when all of that happened, he could have yeah. intervened. I said, um, he was right beside you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was right beside you, grieving with you. Yeah. That this world is evil. Yeah. And he will make that right. And it, but, and it, I'm sure it, it doesn't feel that way. Um, where was God when when Jesus was being tortured? You know. Exactly. When, 
he was right beside, but it didn't feel like that to Jesus. Jesus cried out, where, where are you? Uh, why have you forsaken me? And, and yet, that dark day, I, I keep saying this is what we cling to, because that day, the worst day of all of human history, when God's perfect son, who came to deliver us, mm. was tortured and executed, we call that day not tragic Friday, sad Friday, black Friday, dark right. Friday. We call it good Friday. Yeah. And that's a promise we have that God can take the worst thing you can come up with mm. and somehow create good out of it. I call God, God is the great recycler. <laughs> he, he takes, <laughs> I love that. He takes bad things. I mean, Romans 8, 28, a lot of people think that says that if you love God, only good things will happen to you. It doesn't say that at all. Right. Because right. Paul de describes later in the chapter the things that happened to him, beatings and torture and imprisonment and snakebite and shipwreck. But he was able to look back and say, in all of these things, God worked for my good. And that's the promise that we have. Not, I'll take away all those bad things, but in all of those things, God will work with us for our good. And isn't it so true that those roots grow very deep in very dark, dark soil, don't they? Hmm. Um, they okay. they do. Um, Colleen, I didn't know this, but I, I was doing a little talk one time called Seasons of the Soul. And I talked oh. about springtime, summer, fall, and winter. And when I had these pictures of winter, you know, these trees that in right. my part of the world look completely dead. You can't tell a dead tree from a live tree right now. Right. But... Botanists will tell you that that's when the tree does its most growing. Underground, a lot is happening. That's when the roots are spreading out. And if they don't grow in the winter, you won't have a springtime. Mm -hmm. And earlier we said, uh, that's when people grow most spiritually too. It's, it, when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to imagine. It is a test. It's a, it's a test of faith. And it's okay to go through that, that period of doubt and anger and all that, as we've said, try not to do it alone. Find some people around you can trust to welcome you and accept you in the middle of it. But we grow not by going around hard things, by growing through them. And uh, you know that, I know that. Uh, that is just how growth takes place in this broken world. Um, I think all or individuals studying theology need to be required to take a class where they serve in a hmm. convalescent home, yeah. in a home like where Henry Nowen worked, right. um, in a rehab center, where you go in every day and they don't give a rip what you know. Yes. They are in so much pain and you rub their feet and you wash their tears and you wash hmm. their hair and you change their diapers. Hmm. That's how we grow, isn't yeah. it, Philip? Well, it is. I mean, think of um, Jesus last night with his disciples. You know, he's got one, yeah. one shot. He knows he's leaving, and he's got one shot. And he says, I came for this. And what does he do? He yeah. washes their feet. You know, he doesn't deliver a lecture. He doesn't say, you know, there are 10 points that you really need to remember. You got to read this book, you know. <laughs> like we'd leave a litany of things. Okay, yeah, do this, right. this, this, and this, this. He, he, he says, this, he does this very practical act of taking off their shoes and washing their feet. And he says, you're here to serve. And I mentioned in my book, once I was on a radio program, and this was a person, unlike you, Colleen, who had not even opened the book on Where Is God When It Hurts? And he said to me, okay, you know, I didn't get a chance to read your book, but, and I don't have a lot of time here. Could you just kind of summarize where is God when it hurts in, in a sentence or so? Yeah, hold your hand out while I hit it with a hammer, <laughs> yeah, and, and then said, you'll get it all. <laughs> right. And I said, well, man, it took me a year, a couple of years to write this book. I don't and then I said, well, I guess if I had to summarize it in one sentence, it would be another question. The answer to where is God when it hurts, part of the answer is where is the church when it hurts? Because if we are doing our job, if we're on the front lines, and so often we are, when the hurricane hits, you know, when the tsunami hits, it's world vision, it's habitat yeah. for, you know, it's those groups who are there first. But if we're doing our job, you won't have people standing around saying, where is God? They'll know where God is because God has chosen us, the presence of God, God's body on earth 
to demonstrate that God cares. And if the church does that, it would make such a difference. Instead, we get distracted into all these other things. But if we made that our, our purpose, our goal, as Jesus told us to do on that last night with his disciples, then it would, it would put that question, a difficult question, in a very different light. I wonder how many would show up, actually. I really do. I wonder hmm. how many would show up um, and do what he calls us to do, hmm. which is to lay down our lives. Um, I certainly probably would not have, had I not had a Jonathan who's bottom I still have to sometimes help wife. Hmm. Um, I had so many stupid answers um, until I had the experience of serving. Mm. And now I can't believe I'm so honored to. Right. right. But it was a lot of breaking in the process. Um, Philip, two things. Um, you talk about your uncle who helped raise you. Mm -hmm. I love your blog, by the way. Oh, oh you've got to go. <laughs> yes, it's philipyancey.com. Is that right? That's right, yes. Okay, it's phenomenal. I spent half the day there today. And <laughs> you talked about Winston, yes. and you said um, it really changed your life, watching his life and how other people treated him. Mm. Um, what are some of the things that happened in you as a result of seeing him be taken advantage of, knowing he was a veteran mm. of war and he had done all these right. incredible things, yet he became disabled? Right. You talked about that. Yes, uh, I felt so helpless because my uncle was very important to me and he had a lot of needs, but I live 1,500 miles away. I live in Colorado, he's in Atlanta, Georgia. And Colleen, I don't know if this kind of thing only happens in the South, but it does, it does happen in the South still. His neighbors gathered around him and God assembled a team, we called it Team Winston. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one person who volunteered happened to be the vice president of a caregiving agency. And he knew the nurses, he knew the, the caregivers, he knew the plumbers, the electricians. And yes. he was only supposed to volunteer one hour a week. And he would, he would spend a, sometimes a whole day there taking him to the veterans hospital. And, and again and again, I, I could go through the list. There was another woman who was a diabetes special, specialist who had... Yes who had uh, vision impairment herself, and she could understand what he was going through with my uncle was blind. Every one of those people at the funeral, at the memorial service we had, stood up and said, I wasn't giving, I was getting. <laughs> and yes. isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus said, you don't gain your life by acquiring more and more, you gain it by giving it away. And when you give it away to others, you're the one who gains. And they all said that because my uncle was this, this sweet person who had served his country, who had you know, lived a, a good life, but he was very needy. And one person would just write his checks, checkbook. Pretty simple How thing. How simple Almost, is that? Yeah, anybody can do that. Yes. Another person would make sure that his uh, Meals on Wheels came. An another yes. neighbor, yeah. he had, had two boxer dogs, and they would bring the boxer dogs because they would jump up and lick my uncle's face, you know, and he That's could feel great. that. He's blind. He couldn't see them, but he could pet yeah. them and feel them. And uh, these people just came out of the woodwork. And uh, my goodness, we must have had about 50 people or so at the, at the luncheon. Each one played a role, some big, some small. But he, he, even though he was disabled, you could look at him and say, what a sad life. My uncle never felt like he was living a sad life. He felt like he was living a rich life because the people did exactly what we've been talking about. Even though you said four times his bank account was drained by people who took advantage of yeah. him, and his response was, right. well, I guess I just made a bad decision. That's right. Let Talk it go. About huh? opening oh, well. <laughs> yeah, that's keeping your hands open. And, and what you're saying is people just showed up. Okay, so in the church, if we want to see revolutionary change, which that's what these interviews are about, yes. it's pastors, identify your electricians, your hairdressers, your dog owners, your house cleaners, your right. um, people who, who, your dry cleaner, the gas people, the, you know, check writers, just, right. they're, they're everywhere. And if you just show up, because 
Um, we're facing needing to find some help for my son as I may hmm. have another surgery. And I'm at a loss to know how it's going to come together. Yes. Because there's a sense of, well, we don't know how to help him. Well, mm -hmm. he's just John. Play ball with him. It's great. Yeah, right, right. Now, now our house is going to fall apart if we don't have help. <laughs> but it's really not that complex. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those, Philip, who are, oh, my John, I just have so many more things that I could talk about with you. Um, let's just keep this conversation going. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, in all of the heartaches that you've seen, what are a few common threads and how have those threads been comforted? Hmm. Common threads. It's easy for people to feel guilty. I did something wrong. Mm. I did something to deserve this. It's almost, it's almost inevitable. You know, when, when a, you're, you're in an automobile crash and you think, now what did I do? It's my fault. <laughs> we, we, we go around thinking it's our fault. And uh, that's a common thread. And, okay. and some people just torture themselves. Mm. Somebody with a, a, a child with, with disability issues like yours, you know, I don't know if yeah. you went through that, Colleen, but oh, most I people... Oh, yeah. I have huge parenting guilt. Yeah, so, yeah. And PTSD guilt is actually a common, um, it's a term for those who have PTSD and have mm. survived. Right, right. And that's why I say, if there's only one thing to take away, realize that God is on the side of the sufferer, not the one causing the pain but the one who is on your, at your side, by your side. And sometimes the best way God expresses that is through other people. I think that's what God prefers to do. I, I think God prefers to keep his hands off as much as possible. He, he had his hands on when Jesus came to earth, and he only, he only worked for about three years. And he said, okay, it's yours now, and took off. You know? Isn't that's that what, amazing? <laughs> it is. For, for a lot of us, we would have been just so busy about things for years and years. Three years. Yeah, we would have set up this, you know, management structure oh and all gosh. that kind of stuff. He didn't, it, this best practices manual, he didn't do that. You know? Yes. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, people do deal with that, with that uh, feeling of guilt. And, mm -hmm. and the other, we started with the, the why question. Mm -hmm. And... As you know, there are whole denominations that really focus on that, especially Presbyterian, mm. trying to figure out providence and all that. And that's an important issue that theologians obviously need to deal with it. But I, I would just say, in my own work with the Bible, I've put a lot less in, emphasis on what is God's will and a lot more on what is God's mm. desire. God, mm. the, the God who is on the side of the sufferer, wants us to be whole, has promised that we will be whole mm. got, and healed one day. Um, I remember hearing Johnny Erickson, and she was talking to uh, a group of people who were mentally challenged, and nothing was really getting through, and she was very struggling. And then, and then suddenly she said, and then one day you'll have new minds. And suddenly they all kind of jumped up and applauded, you know, <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> they, they knew more than anybody that yep. they didn't have the, the same equipment as everybody else. And what she was saying yeah. is, you will get it one day. God wants you to have it, and God will yeah. see that you do have it. And that's, that's so important. The, the modus operandi for the church I get out of 2 Corinthians 1, a couple of oh great phrases. Yeah, Paul yes. says, may the God of all comfort, I love that phrase, the God of all comfort, who has comforted you, May you take that comfort and spread it to others who need it. Some of us are in a time when we need that comfort. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to see God as the God of all comfort, not as the God of all hard things, you know, the God of all or comfort. Or the God of all fix-its. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. <laughs> or the yeah. God of all answers. It's the God of all comfort. It's the God of all comfort, right. Yeah, I mean, every mother... When, when something bad happens, you, you take the child and you say, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. It's just instinctive. Well, sometimes it actually, it's not gonna all be okay. That's right. <laughs> but God can actually say, it'll be okay. I, you can trust me on yeah. that, I guarantee it. That was the answer to Job. You know, Job, yeah, you're right. There are a lot of bad things going on, but 
I'm not worried because I'm God. I know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> <laughs> I know the end. And yeah. so just trust me on that. Right, exactly. And that is a leap at times. It is a leap. And often it's not something that you can come to without a space, without a period of time when you just wonder, is it possible? Um, Philip, do you have any last words for those who are um, maybe in doubt? You know, a few of those threads who are in doubt or who are needing help or longing for that comfort? Yes, I do. When I got the call to go to Newtown, Connecticut, mm. that's the last thing in the world I wanted to do. It was the week of Christmas. And I thought, what can I possibly say to bring comfort to these people who kiss their little six-year-old, seven-year-old goodbye, mm. put them on a school bus, and then later that same day had to go to a morgue and identify their bullet-riddled bodies? I, I, what, what can I possibly say? I happened to be doing an article on the new atheist. I had been reading Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and... They had phrases like this. Uh, I think it was Richard Dawkins who said, we live in a, a blind, pitiless universe of random indifference. <laughs> and uh, it was, he, he went on to say that humans are just a, just a random accident of nature that will never be repeated. It's like, you know, the, life is like a match. It flares for a minute and then it goes out. The universe well, is how like much that. fun is that? Yeah, right. <laughs> And I, I started noticing whenever we have a tragedy like 9 11 mm. or uh, what Paris has been going through recently mm. after the bombings and terrorist acts there, or even a small thing like Sandy Hook, mm. I, I started watching the New York Times. You know, they didn't, they didn't call on Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens because they didn't really have words of comfort. It wouldn't help to get up in front of those parents and say, well, get used to it. It's a blind, pitiless universe Life of random stinks. indifference, you know? I mean, I don't, I don't mean to mock them, but even the New York Times, they turn to pastors, priests, and rabbis at a moment like that. And not every, obviously not everybody is going to believe the Christian story. We know that. Sure. But we could, I could stand in front of them and say, this is the promise that I believe. I believe I know where your children are. They're in the loving arms of God. They're safe. Because Jesus yeah. said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. Those are among the last words he said. And Jesus is there with Jesus right now. And you don't have to believe that. A lot of people don't. But it, it, believe me, those parents, more than anything else, they didn't want to understand the philosophy, the theodicy of suffering. They the five to know, points of Calvinism. Yeah, and, right. You know, Arminianism. Th that's right. That. Yeah, I mean, they weren't they weren't interested. Their question was, "Will I ever see my little girl, my little boy again?" Oh my gosh. And we believe, yes, you will. <laughs> Here's how, and and that is a true word of actual comfort. And it's going to be hard for people to believe. Uh, not everybody does, but consider the alternatives. <laughs> They're not very bright. <laughs> It is, right. it is a word of true hope that we can offer in the midst of a broken world. You know, it is, um, it is the only hope because we have a living God. Mm. So many worship, many worship other gods who are not living gods, but we mm -hmm. are promised in his word that he is a living, active, involved God. Mm. That's something that I want. It's a great to reminder. Thank you. Well, it's something that I have to live by because the alternative is quite a bummer. You know, what What do we make of that? Um, Philip, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to speak to all of us and, and to have wrestled with your faith like you have and then to share it in such a gracious manner. Thank you so very much. Um, I want to encourage you as you have listened or been a part of this interview and watched it, please look up philipyancy.com and look through his blog and he talks about a story of a car accident in which he nearly died. And that's a teaser I'm going to leave you with because it's an unbelievable story. <laughs> um, but contact Philip, contact me at Insight for Living. Give us a call and we want you to know that we care about you. 
and about your sorrow, and you will not ever be pushed away. You will be listened to and respected and loved and cared for and pointed to the God of hope, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you so much for being a part of this time.